Uh, you are uh, joining us tonight on June 27th, 2024, with uh, the Friends of Candelaria Nature Preserves monthly speaker series. I'm Katie Stone, and as always, I'm delighted to be bringing you a speaker who's going to speak to things that we care about in our valley and that are affecting our preserve. And so our guest tonight is one of my dearest friends in public broadcasting, Laura Paskus. She's probably familiar to most of you from NMPBS. She's been reporting on environmental issues in New Mexico the whole time I've known her since 2002, when she began her career in the high country news. She's worked in print, online, radio, and television outlets covering the most important environmental issues of our generation. She's the author of the fabulous book. If you haven't read it, you should. It's called At the Precipice, New Mexico's Changing Climate. She's also the senior producer of the series on NMPBS called Our Land, New Mexico's Environmental Past, Present, and Future. Here I'll interject that the Our Land series has some fabulous learning components that go hand in hand with it at pbslearningmedia.org. It's a really great site to find all kinds of, of curriculum for teachers, but in particular the Our Land series has some just terrific resources for students of all ages, uh, no matter how young you may be. Uh, Let's see, over the course of her career, Laura Paskus has freelanced for local, regional, and national outlets. She's been the managing editor for the Tribal College Journal, a publication of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. And she is a reporter and producer for KUNM FM, Go Public Radio in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And she is the environmental reporter for the New Mexico Political Report. In 2024, the Tory House Press will be publishing her brand new book, Water Bodies, Love Letters to the Most Abundant Substance on Earth. <laughs> Please give a very warm welcome to our dear guest. Uh, thank you for being with us, Laura Paskus. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Oh, I love you, Katie. And I totally appreciate the really nice introduction. Um, and especially the shout out for uh, our PBS Learning Media um, lesson plans. We're pretty excited about those and have three new ones coming out that are around a series that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen. Everybody bear with me, because even though I practiced two minutes ago, um, you never know. So, um, okay. And I'm going to remember to go up here to share sound and it's clicked. Okay. Um, so tonight I'm talking about loving a changing world while still fighting for justice. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that topic and title as we go along. And I'm going to start with some really remedial climate change education for all of you. And, you know, most of you, all of you will probably know all of this, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, I think it's really important. And just by the way, at the end, after I stop sharing my screen, I'm going to put a whole bunch of links in the chat for you. But this is from what's called the Leap Ahead report that came out back in 2022. And I think it's something that it's really good to keep in mind. So we already know that New Mexico has warmed about three degrees since the 1970s. And we're looking at warming another five to seven degrees Fahrenheit over the next 50 years. Um, another number that I really just want to draw attention to is the second sentence highlighted in red about the projected declines in our major rivers. Um, we know this is happening. We've known it was going to happen. Um, and, and this is something that is important for all of us to be paying attention to for lots of reasons, human reasons, wildlife reasons, um, and my personal opinion, spiritual reasons. Um, so just... This report, which I will include the link to, um, I feel like this report 
maybe some of you have seen it and read it, but I don't feel like this report really got the um the attention that it deserved back in 2022. It, if if many of you remember, 2022 was a really hard year. Um, that was the year that our fire season blew up in early April with the McBride fire and then Hermit's Peak, Calf Canyon, um, the Rio Grande dried through Albuquerque 2022. So we were pretty stunned. I feel like anybody paying attention to the world around them, it was a challenging year, but this report kind of flew under the radar in my mind. Um, so I have been writing about the Rio Grande for more than 20 years. And I'm often surprised when people think that there is no news coverage of what's happening to the Rio Grande or that we don't know what's happening to the Rio Grande or understand what's happening. And so I just pulled out three stories, um, one from 20, 2002 from High Country News, another from 2012 at KUNM, and then another one in 2022. So we know that our rivers in New Mexico are being greatly affected by climate change. And we know that the Rio Grande and the middle Rio Grande um, is facing a lot of challenges. Um, it's not a surprise. And anybody who is surprised has not been paying attention. So why is the climate changing in New Mexico? <laughs> um, or why is climate changing across the world? It's because of our greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, we have a progressive governor right now. We have all kinds of Democrats um, in charge of the state, and yet our greenhouse gas emissions are going crazy. Our oil production is um, is at record highs. Um, you know, we're looking at um, continuing to increase our uh, oil production in the Permian Basin. I don't know if any of you have been down in the Permian um, I have a friend who works down there and and this is, you know, all due respect to the people who live there and who love that place and and all of that. But she has described it as a hellscape to me. And that's that's pretty disturbing. I haven't been down there in a couple of years and the the development is even um, it is just it's just bonkers. It sounds like. Um, you know, along with that development, New Mexico has passed these different um, rules to rein in greenhouse gas emissions. New Mexico lawmakers like to portray themselves as leaders on climate change. But in fact, um, we are a huge part of we as New Mexicans are a huge part of the problem when it comes to climate change. And um, as Jerry Redfern, if you don't follow Capital in Maine, they're a news outlet out of Los Angeles, but they have a local reporter, Jerry Redfern, who covers oil and gas issues and does a, a the best job in the state, in my opinion, on covering oil and gas issues. But this hydrogen ecosystem as he reports, is coming to New Mexico. Um, the governor has been a strong proponent of hydrogen, um, which many people can point to and say it's it's great on the consumer end, maybe for cutting emissions um, on the production end. More energy goes into the production of hydrogen than saves. So hydrogen is not a good deal for New Mexico. Um, so what does continued warming mean for New Mexico? And you all know this. Um, it looks a lot like this. Um, dry reservoirs, burned homelands and mountains. And then the bottom right picture is up in the Jemez where um, this is in 2000, this is 10 years after Las Conchas. And you can see that East flank of the Jemez, the conifer forest was utterly destroyed. And so that area is coming back, not as a conifer forest, but as a scrubland, which of course has huge impacts for um, the people who live downstream, 
for ecosystems downstream, for the entire watershed downstream. So um, we know that the continued emphasis on the fossil fuel industry is having a big footprint across the world and including in our state. So these are, again, things that you all know. As it gets warmer, there's more evaporation from rivers, lakes, and canals. We have thirstier forests, crops, and orchards. We have a longer growing season to go along with our uh, constrained water supplies and a longer allergy season as well. We see less runoff coming throughout the year, but when it does come, it tends to come earlier and faster, which causes all sorts of problems. Um, We'll see increases in diseases, whether that's something like valley fever or diseases spread by mosquitoes and other insects that are moving north. Um, I think something that we don't always talk about, but you know, climate change has impacts on entire species that are unable to adapt to getting warmer and drier. It also causes a lot of suffering to individual animals and local populations of animals. Um, of course, we know all about our fire season and the post wildfire impacts. Um, like that picture up in the Jemez, we know that a lot of species don't come back because it's warmer and drier. Um, all kinds of other issues, water quality for the lower levels of water that are there infrastructure, homeowners insurance and issues with that. So no shortage of impacts. There's also some public health threats that I just want to mention. Um, you know, illnesses from particulates from smoke and poor water quality, but also a lot of phys physical and mental health impacts from fires, floods and heat waves. You know, thinking about it just, I'm still at work. It rained in the UNM area a few minutes ago, but, um, all these places are hotter, prisons, schools. Think about your kids out on the soccer field. I know um, my daughter who just graduated from high school is a soccer player. And you know that season starts in July and goes usually to like October and kids are out there in crazy, crazy hot conditions. I, I shudder to think of what it's like for football players to be out in these conditions. Um, also pet shelters, they're all hotter. People who work outside, whether that's people working in fields or sanitation, even your mailman, um, people who work outside suffer and sometimes die as it gets hotter. I've been learning a lot from the folks at Project Echo about how he interacts with medications, including dopaminergic um, medications for certain types of mental illness. Of course, the heat puts unbearable pressure on our unhoused population and a strain on hospitals, clinics, and emergency workers, including wildland firefighters who work basically year-round nowadays. And in general, these heat waves, I know I definitely feel this. They make us madder, sadder, and unhappier. We also see things like um, certain types of crimes increasing during heat waves and certainly mental health challenges. So it's a scary world, but oh my God, raise your hand if you love this place and it is beautiful and we love New Mexico with our whole hearts, right? Is the whole reason you're spending your time with me on Zoom right now. So this was a couple of years ago when the Rio Grande through Albuquerque was about to dry. There's a rainbow because there is hope, right? We have hope. So I don't know if any of you listen to On Being with Krista Tippett. I'm like a casual listener, but this episode, and I'll put the link um, with Colette Pichon Battle, was one of the best things I've heard in a long time. And she's an attorney and climate activist. She's from New Orleans. She, her family um, had to deal with Katrina. Um, and she said during that interview to really admit climate, to really, really admit that you understand what is happening to the planet. It will break your heart. If you don't cry deep, hard tears for the state of this planet and all of the people on it, you don't yet understand the problem. So once you get to the plate, that place, the only thing that can bring you out of that kind of darkness is belief in something greater than yourself. I really 
I encourage you to listen to this interview with her. She is extraordinary. It's a really powerful interview that I think I've listened to like four or five times now. Very hopeful, very beautiful. So one of the things that, you know, I've spent more than 20 years reporting on climate change and environmental issues and giving people all the facts, um, tons of data, like I just overloaded you with. Um, and, you know, I kind of feel like at this point, if people don't understand what's happening, it's... Um, it's not my fault anymore. <laughs> you know, I used to think like if I just covered it smarter and better and in a different way and a, on TV instead of radio that people would understand. And at this point, you know, people, people have to know what's happening. And like Katie mentioned, um, we do these lesson plans. And whenever I talk to young people, particularly in New Mexico, young people understand the climate is changing. They, they understand that they're growing up in an entirely different world from that of their parents and their, their grandparents. And I am unbelievably proud of New Mexico's young people for understanding the challenges and um, doing a lot of great youth activism around climate change. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I've done all this, you know, data driven, fact based, brr, all kinds of reporting. And with this new special that we have coming out on New Mexico PBS, I I realized I needed to do something a little bit different. So we have a special coming out in about two weeks, just over two weeks, and it's called Loving Our Changing Homelands. And I just want to be clear, when when I talk about that we need to love our changing homelands, that we need to adapt, we need to still love these places that have changed, and never for like one instant saying that we don't, as a species, try to address and work to address the problem the the fact of greenhouse gas emissions and the fact of inequity across the globe. Um, so I just want to like preface that when I say like we still need to love the places that have burned or dried or changed, I'm never saying like give up on fighting the fossil fuel industry. So just to be clear on that. Um, so this, this special that's coming out, I'm really excited about it because it features some of my favorite people in New Mexico, including Teresa Pasquale from the Pueblo of Acoma, Phoebe Sweena, who is the baddest badass of all the hydrologists. Um, she's from the Pueblo of Cochiti. Um, Sister Joan Brown, who I'm sure many of you know, um, Erin Loudon, also from the Pueblo of Acoma, and then Paula Garcia. And again, I'm sure you all know Paula Garcia. She is the executive director of the New Mexico Asequia Association. And really um, just an incredible human being. And also, boy, did she work hard for her community and for New Mexicans during and after the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fires. And she continues to show up for her community um, in, in every way, every single day. And so she was actually the inspiration for this special. She, I saw her at the New Mexico Asiki Association's annual Congreso in December, 2022. And sort of during the opening welcome, she talked about, you know, that was, if anybody was there, that was a really hard Congresso to be at. Um, so many people had lost so much and um it was it was a hard even as an outsider it was hard to be there for that and paula got up there and she talked about how even though the mountain has changed it is still in our care and um it really had a huge impact on me so anyway so paula is the inspiration for this and i am giving you all sneak peeks into the special, which again, I'm super excited about. So um, here is Paula kind of starting off the show. Yeah, this is one of the places to me that is most devastating to look at because 
In years past, this whole area was completely heavenly. It was just covered with trees. And you could see trees as far as the eye could see. And now, from this vantage point, it's all black. There. So, um, yeah, so we spent a few days with Paula. She took us um, to a lot of places that are special to her and her family. We got to meet her family, um, hang out with her dad and one of her uncles who um, who showed us the the ways in which those fires impacted them personally um and heard their stories and you know whether it was the fire or the floods that came afterwards um you know life changed forever for these people and it's it's so hard to be thinking right yeah. now about the salt fire um and the South Fork fire and this happening all over again. And it's going to happen again and again and again as the Southwest continues warming. But I just want to also play you this clip from Paula. Yeah, this is one ah, of the places. That's not the one. Sorry. This one. We were taught to be caretakers of the land. And now that role as caretaker is more important than ever. And these lands, even though they've burned and we can assign blame or we can look at causes, at climate change, the forest service, and no matter what the cause of the fire is, ultimately this is our home and these are our beloved lands and they're still in our care and they're going to be in the care of our children and grandchildren. So as, as caretakers, we have to still love the land. It looks very different. And the way that that love will manifest is through staying here and working our farmland like we always have, but also we have a new responsibility of healing. As we heal the land, I think we're going to heal ourselves. And again, I just, I love Paula. And I think that she she's talking specifically about Northern New Mexico, but she, I feel like what she's saying applies to all of us um whether our what we can grow in our fields has changed because of the climate change whether our relationship with the rio grande has changed i know my relationship with the just the east side of the sandias has certainly changed over the last 30 years as um you know one of my favorite hiking trails is an entirely different landscape from the one that I hiked on as a much younger woman. Um, but I think about, I think about what Paula said, and I think about this connection that New Mexicans have with our landscapes, whether we're somebody like Paula, whose family has lived here for eight generations, or um, somebody like Phoebe Sweena or Teresa Pascual, who's, who's, uh, tribes have been here since time immemorial or someone like me who's a newcomer. Um, it is possible for each of us to learn about where we live, to connect with where we live, to care for it and love it, and to act in not just for ourselves, but for the future of these places and ecosystems and species and communities that we care about. Um, so I just want to show you one. We were. Ah, sorry. One other clip from the special. It's an hour long special. So I'm, I'm sharing like a minute and a half of it. But, um, but here's just one more clip. When I think about the connection of landscape and stewardship and the value, the core value of love, I have to think back to what's embedded in our traditional stories, our stories that take us back to the point of emergence when we were given these responsibilities of not only stewardship of what was created for us, but also that in doing so, we express our gratitude and our love. In 
And so the reason it was zooming in on those seeds is the um, part of the show features Aaron Loudon, the young man standing with Teresa there, and he is a seed saver and he does amazing work at the Pueblo of Acoma with a bunch of other young people as well. Um, and they're doing seed saving and growing and traditional, um, like trying to grow traditional foods and share, but also um, they're rematriating seeds to the Pueblo of Acoma. So seeds that were taken away by collectors or companies or even the federal government are being brought back to the Pueblo of Acoma as Aaron explained it to us so that they can be grown in their original soils with their original waters, with their original caretakers. Um, and in kind of remembering and learning from and building on the past, that is something that will help the people of Acoma survive into a warming future. Um, Teresa, Teresa and I have been friends for a really long time, and she once explained to me how for the people of Acoma, they don't have the option of moving if it's too hard to live there as the climate warms. You know, it's not like, you know, we see climate migrants all over the world, um, people moving um, to get away from flooding or fires or the inability to 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 grow crops anymore. But for the people of Acoma, that is their homeland. That is where they live. That is where their ancestors are and their knowledge is. So they have to adapt to climate change within those ancestral homelands. And then you add the overlay of a foreign government, of the US government that puts tribes into a box and people have to, uh, yeah, have to survive, have to adapt to a warming world within both of those kinds of um, system. So anyway, I feel like I'm basically kind of rambling at this point, but um, I just want to put a plug in to hopefully that you all will watch the show on July 12th. It kind of, in some ways for me, pulls together 20 years of climate reporting, but in a way that I hope resonates with people who love this place and want want a, a better future for New Mexico and a sustainable and equitable and safe future. Um, and also features like some of my favorite people in the world. So I'm going to, I think, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pop in the chat just to paste a bunch of um, links in there. And I put some of those in there too, Laura, as you were going along. Thank you, Katie. Sure. So, I don't know if y'all have questions, but I'm going to mute myself here for a second. Well, actually, there was a question kind of early on in your talk uh, when you were discussing the um, uh, disproportionate play, play that New Mexico has in contributing to climate disaster. So I think it's Lori Brandt, um, if I'm not mistaken, recently read that if New Mexico were a nation, it would be 14th in world oil production. That's kind of horrifying. I totally believe that. And I, I'm i surprised it's 14. I'm surprised we're not higher. Um, I mean, I totally believe your numbers, but um, yeah, it's the, the rate at which we are drilling is, it's so scary and disappointing because we know better, right? Well, I guess I'll ask your first question from the group, which is uh, a lot of us are people who are here because we love nature, we love the river, we do our best to protect the river and we have protected this particular acreage alongside the river that's at the Candelaria Nature Preserve. There is a movement of the oil industry that almost feels uh, 
I don't know. It's so epic. It's so huge. How, how do we even begin the tackling? And I say this saying, you know, everybody we know should do their strength and, and what they can do. I obviously am in my little niche of trying to just change minds before they're set. Uh, how, how do we do it? Because we have a system that almost seems like our politicians that we elect that promise us they're going to work on climate change issues. They get into office and is there a boogeyman that hangs over them that says we can't, we're, we're going to turn a blind eye to what's happening in the Permian Basin and also up in Farmington? Yeah, I would say that boogeyman is the fossil fuel industry. You know, it's been interesting to watch the strategies of um, like everybody knows the climate is changing. Everyone knows that we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Even car makers have, have made big changes. Um, there's so much happening on that front. So what does the oil and gas industry do or the oil industry? They pivot and all of a sudden we need more plastics and plastics is the answer. Um, cause the, or hydrogen is the answer or, um, they're always looking to sell that next thing to us in our best interest, right? Oh, COVID was really terrible. So everybody needs disposable plastic things because you don't want to be spreading germs. Um, they, the oil and gas industry jumps into any niche they can. Um, and they rely really heavily, not just on misinformation, but disinformation. And it is so predominant throughout our culture. You know, it used to be that people could readily identify. They'd look at their newspaper or watch TV and you could readily identify what's an ad, what's an op-ed, what's a news story. And, and now all of those lines have blurred. And so speaking specifically of politicians, and I know, I know some of you and you're, 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 intimately involved in the political system in New Mexico. And I appreciate you for doing that. And more people just need to keep doing it. I, I, I am flummoxed by the governor's support for hydrogen. I, I literally don't understand, um, you know, sort of beyond my most cynical thoughts I don't understand why this governor is so focused on hydrogen when she knows better. Um, so I think it is just a matter of always keeping at it, um, knowing that you as an individual cannot do everything, but there are other people in your networks who can do some things that you can't do. And so community building is always the biggest thing in my mind that we all need to be doing. Um, but holding those politicians accountable all the time, um, calling, visiting. I just, I, I don't know what their problem is, but I know the fossil fuel industry is incredibly strong. Well, they do show up. Right. They're, they're the ones showing up to the interim committee meetings right now. They're the ones showing up to the PRC meetings. They're the ones showing up to the fundraisers. They're showing up. And, and it's a, it, it is possible to get your foot in the door, but all of us who do know our governor, and maybe our governor will have a chance to even see this video, need to know that those who love her the most are just shocked and appalled by her embracing of a known toxin for us. Um, Laura, let's jump on to one other topic. Unless somebody else has questions, you should stick your hand up. Um, you have a new book coming out, Water Bodies, Love Letters to the Most Abundant Substance in Our Beautiful Planet Earth. I added beautiful planet. Talk about it. So it's a collection of essays and poems from some of my favorite Western writers. Um, and like some of those people are like Daniel Rothberg from the Nevada Independent and Luke Runyon, who used to work for KUNC, like all these like really brilliant 
journalists and writers who write a lot about like nerdy water stuff. And I asked them to write um, really personal essays that they wouldn't want to share with anybody. And they did that. And they're really, um, they're personal and beautiful. And the emphasis is, the book is kind of focused around this idea that water is a being onto itself. Like, yes, water supports us and we need water and it creates ecosystems, but it is also a conscious being of its own. Um, so that's kind of like the overarching theme of the book. And then the emphasis among each of the writers and poets is this sort of love for their local waters, like the little waters. We can't do anything about the whole basin, but you can you can go and sit by your favorite little spot of water. Um, and that will be coming out in October. And actually the book launch will be at Bookworks. I think it's October 1st. That's fantastic. And yes, you uh, are, are reminding us well that we actually do have agency and making a pretty big difference to the watershed right near us, wherever that is. And, and for us here by this beautiful preserve, one of those tasks can always be picking up, picking up, picking up after all the litter bugs around us. Um, Laura, you've been to the Candelaria Nature Preserve recently. Clearly, you're seeing the work we're doing on rewilding and restoration. And uh, I, I hope you see that as inspiring because our vision has really taken into account the changing climate as part of the foundation of the work that we're doing. And I guess I wonder, uh, this model, we modeled on other models of, of folks who, who have thought this through ahead of us, but it's sustainable and it's replicable. And are you seeing it in, in any way? I mean, we're, we're recreational, obviously, and, and for preservation and nature. Are you seeing it in other ways in, in commercial applications or? Any other ways where it's like a practical thing to do? I, I'm not saying that what we're doing is impractical because sometimes there's there's no measurement of that for nature. Yeah, so I love it. And I love, I love you know, obviously like I would love to go camping and blah, blah, blah and go far away from my home and have outdoor connections. But the most important ones are the connections we make with nature in our immediate spaces and in particular, urban spaces. And I think she's on here, Laurel Ladwig and her Albuquerque Backyard Refuge Program. I cannot love that program more. I mean, I just think it is the best thing. And I'll just, I'll just, I'm sure everybody knows, but the Albuquerque Backyard Refuge Program, I feel like is a, was like a life changer for me because being a part of that program, it helped me remember that I'm connected to all these other yards, all these other refuges, and all these other people who who want to make a difference, who want to have pollinators, who, you know, and so all of those things are so important for how they change our own hearts and our actions and our connections to one another. Um, and so I love seeing these sorts of restoration projects like um, is happening at Candelaria Nature Preserve too. Um, are there any other questions? I know it's a busy night for folks and folks really want to get on to the madness of the national political spectrum. And, uh, Laura Paskus, it's just such a pleasure to have you speak with our group and um, hear your your vision and your stories. Uh, when you talk about justice, I want to give you one more question before we go, and that is to leave us with a thought about how how is it that our our love of nature and our our love of justice are entwined and. And how is it that that you're inspired by the work you're seeing and the people that you meet to to keep 
to keep doing this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me personally, like New Mexico has its challenges, right? Like we have so many challenges and yet we live in the most beautiful place with the coolest communities. We all know each other. We all have connections. I think in in New Mexico, we have the ability to remember to take care of one another and and one another's futures. Like our diversity in New Mexico is always going to be our strength, right? Because we have so many different ways of knowing the world and thinking about the world and adapting to the world. And I think that New Mexico is, we have the opportunity to model to other places that diversity is a strength, that you build community and take care of one another, whether that's our human neighbors or our more than human neighbors. And so I think that justice is, is, is like an integral part of everything we do that's, you know, nature related because we're part of nature too. So anyway, I think that for a long time, the environmental movement was siloed and in New Mexico, we know better. And in New Mexico, we know that that environmental justice and more than human justice and ecosystem justice, those are all the same things. Mm. Jeannie Allen has a question for you. Hi, that was so beautiful. I'm going to listen to this again so I can write that down, what you just said, Laura. But in terms of doing something about this, do you have a favorite or a couple of favorites lobbying groups so that we're not all coming from different directions, but we we hit like targeted times and and issues? That's a great question. So one of the things that I've been trying to remember, so thank you for prompting me. Um, one of the things I've been trying to remember when I'm talking to groups of um, people who are like my age is reminding people about the youth activists in this state who are killing it. <laughs> they are doing such great work. And even if you don't agree on every single issue or every stance, I think there are endless opportunities for people of my generation and older for us to be allying ourselves with these youth organizations and asking them, what do you need from me? How do you need me to show up for you? Um, you know, whether that's Yucca Youth United for Climate Change Action or Pueblo Action Alliance, they're doing incredible work. Um, Tewa Women United is another group um, that's not always like climate related, but they do amazing stuff. Um, I'm totally drawing a blank now that I don't have a list in front of me, but finding young people and say and asking them, how do you need me to show up for you? That's a Thank great you answer. So That's a great answer. Laura Paskus, uh, environmental journalist. You can find a lot of her work at nmpbs.org. And her series is called Our Land. The latest in the series comes out on July 11th. I think is what I heard you say. It is called, is that what you just said? July, July 12th. Oh, close. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm searching for the name of it, which I jotted down in incomprehensible writing here. Um, oh, it's Loving Our Changing Homelands. And it's it's on New Mexico PBS. Um, like I'm just taking over the New Mexico and Focus show that week. So if you watch New Mexico and Focus, you'll see it. And they are very good about posting their work online. Laura Pascas has also a whole uh, lot of curriculum available with her work. That's a, for educators of students of all ages. Laura Pascas, thank you very much for being with us at the Friends of Candelaria Nature Preserve Monthly Speaker Series. We've learned a lot thank from you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fantastic. Thank you so much, Laura.